What's up, guys? Welcome to DeFi Top Signal. Today, we got Nick Drake on. He's a seasoned trader, investor, and has over two decades of experience in the financial markets. He's known for his conservative approach to investing, as well as his deep understanding on how to navigate the ups and downs in this market. Nick, what's up, man? Hey, guys. I'm great. How are you? I'm chilling. Yeah, I'm chilling. Yeah, we're, we're solid. We're solid. A lot of turmoil in the markets in the past couple of days, uh, as you know, uh, especially with the USDC depegging and uh, um, now markets go up, markets go down, banks, you know, uh, bank runs. We want to kind of understand and get your perspective on, um, you know, where we are, um, what you're doing in, in terms of how to navigate through this market and um, just, you know, it, I guess high level. Uh, if you want to just kind of introduce yourself and and kind of, um, you know, tell us about your background a little bit and what you're working on. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so around about 20 years ago, I dropped out of law school to play poker full time. Um, so trying to solve somewhat complex puzzles um, uh, uh, when there is a pot of gold at the end of that exercise is is something that has that has appealed to me um from from when i was a teenager um so playing poker was that uh, you know field that kind of that itch if you like in my 20s um i did that professionally um till i got to uh around about 28 29 years old um and and that was very instructive it taught me a lot about um bankroll management it taught me a lot about thinking about things in terms of um probabilities it turned me a lot about self-discipline, self-awareness. Um, it taught me a lot about the world. I got to travel the world, meet a lot of people. Um, it taught me to be very wary of other humans, um, always try and watch my back, always assume that something might go wrong, um, hedge your bets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Being a professional gambler is, or being a professional poker player is a crash course in how to manage oneself if you were going to be in the business of trading markets. Um, so that was a very good education for me. Um, and I had a great time doing it. Coming out of that, um, I, I became, in, became investing my money, um, understanding fin financial markets and, and using the skill set that I developed playing poker to uh, play a more complex and a bigger game, which is the financial markets. Um, I also have an entrepreneurial itch um, so throughout that, I opened a few businesses in the poker in, in the poker world. And after that, I entered the e-commerce space. So this is pretty early, 2009, 2010. If you can't tell from my accent, I grew up in Australia. Around that time, you couldn't really buy too much online. So e-commerce was quite new, seemed like to be a growing space. Um, the Facebook ad pools were just developing. So there seemed to be a, a, a similar problem set to playing poker that I could apply to running an e-commerce business which is trying to work out where I could find an edge in buying advertising on Facebook and then parlaying that into um, acquiring customers for less than what the lifetime value of that customer was. So that was a lot of fun. Exited that space 2016, 2017 after I raised some money, grew the business to be fairly big and then punted it off to some private equity friends. Um, throughout that period, I was somewhat interested in crypto. Um, most people don't remember or weren't around, but um, moving money around the world for, for, for poker players and for gamblers was one of the first use cases that didn't involve using the Silk Road for Bitcoin. Um, if you're playing cards and you're traveling around the world, it's really hard to move large sums of money. The banking system is slow. They didn't want to deal with us. Um, so it was really hard. Um, there were times where you'd, you'd, you'd jump on a plane with um, six figures of cash and declare it and go through that scary process. So um, very early on, 2011, 2012, uh, around that time, people that, that owed me money from my poker days that I'd written off and I hadn't heard of for a couple of years started sending me Bitcoin to pay off what they owed. I, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't really care. I'd written off the money, but I kept it. I didn't sell any. And then fast forward to 2017, when I got out of the e-commerce business, um, I moved to Europe just because I wanted a change of scenery. And at that time, uh, mid to the end of 2017, um, you know, Bitcoin caught a bid 
15, 20,000. Um, the ICO craze happened. So at that point, I'm like, I've got all this Bitcoin. What the fuck do I do? Um, so I looked into it, read the white paper, um, understood it. I go, okay, this makes sense. Um, but I started looking into everything else. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, all these different ICOs that were popping up. And, and because I'd had at that point, probably a good decade of analyzing equities and businesses and understanding how to, you know, read a P&L and a balance sheet. I understood business and I looked at these ICOs and, and it was very obvious that um, they were all just hot air. So I, I, it was difficult to do, but um, I found a few ways to short everything that I could that wasn't Bitcoin and Ethereum. Those are the two that seem to make some sense to me. I'm not a technical guy. Um, and there was not a ton of information out there at the time around, you know, the bull case for Ethereum and 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 for Bitcoin, it still seemed somewhat fringe. But I got it. I got it from a conceptual standpoint. But everything else just seemed like a steaming pile of dog shit. So that worked out pretty well, as we know, um, uh, the crypto market. So 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 what I did is I shorted everything against my Bitcoin position that I that I had from all those years ago, and that worked out alright. And then I forgot about it um, because everything you know dropped and there was nothing really going on. At the end of 2019, guys, a lot of my friends from the poker days um, now have careers uh, as hedge fund managers, um, market makers, etc., working in the in, in the financial markets in very senior positions. And we talk very frequently because I love that stuff, um, not just from a trading standpoint, but also just from a intellectual curiosity standpoint. And and at that point, a lot of people that I really respect that are really smart and and they have a shit ton of money that are in the space started talking to me about the collapse of, or the potential collapse of the global fiat currency system due to the money printing that was going on over the last eight or nine years. And traditionally the way that you would express a view like that was to buy precious metals. And it's not a new view. People have had that view for decades. Um, but the view started to gain some momentum towards the end of 2019 because all of the traditional metrics you would look at that would give you, um, that, that, that may cause alarms in terms of, hey, this shit's unsustainable. What the hell are you guys doing? Um, started to intensify. And Bitcoin entered that conversation for the first time with these friends of mine that had been working on Wall Street for 10 or 15 years. So at that point, started reading the white paper again, looking into all the information and trying to understand what all these crazy people um, that were talking about Bitcoin were actually talking about. And for whatever reason, it just really clicked at that time. I was obviously influenced with, you know, by people that I trust and that had access to a lot more information than me, but it really clicked. So I bought it, started buying a shit ton of Bitcoin at that time. Then COVID happens a few months later, early in 2020. Um, and, and it becomes very clear by March when the world's about to descend into chaos that governments around the world would need to start printing a ton of money to prevent the mother of all recessions. Um, so because Bitcoin was so fresh in my mind at that time, the reason to buy Bitcoin six months ago was that governments had printed too much money and something's going to break. Well, at that point, <laughs> That thesis got five times stronger because they were about to print more money than they ever had to get the world out of the COVID crisis. So when the equity markets and Bitcoin crashed in early March, um, we kind of just couldn't buy enough Bitcoin and couldn't buy enough equities. At that point, um, you know, things got a bit crazy around the world. I was living in the Canary Islands at the time, had nothing else to do. Um, and DeFi summer started. And for the first time in, in its history or in my history, there was actually something to analyze that wasn't just a white paper. These DeFi protocols, you could use them. You could do things. You could earn yield. You could lend. You could borrow. And, and, and now it started to resemble somewhat <laughs> in a very primitive format um, the, the systems that I, that I understood a lot better. Um, and, and, and now you had something to analyze. There was cash flows, there were fees generated, there was, you know, and it got really interesting. So that's when I've kind of pivoted to full-time crypto because there was so many opportunities to make money there. 
Um, equities were also at an all-time high by the time we got to the end of 2020. Um, so buying tech stocks at that time just didn't seem that it made a lot of sense. So pivoting to crypto and, and, and trying to, you know, walk into that, that, that jungle and, 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 and try and find ways to make money seemed to be smart. Um, and it was very analogous to, to, to playing poker in the early 2000s where you'd play on these poker sites or you'd walk into these underground games and you didn't know if you're going to be cheated. You didn't know if someone was going to pull a gun on you. And, and it was the same in DeFi where you didn't know if you were going to get rugged. You didn't know if you were going to get, going to get hacked. You just didn't know. So I, I had some experience <laughs> in operating in a very uncertain environment and trying to manage my risk when, when you could lose all of your money. So I felt somewhat comfortable, at least more comfortable than, than, than most people. And, and it was a fantastic time to be alive. 2021 was one of the greatest bull markets of all time, crypto or, the, or otherwise. Everything was going up, lots of things to analyze. Um, and, and I got the bug. And, uh, you know, by the time we got to the end, of, the end of 2021, it became very obvious that some of these systems were completely full of hot air. The markets had got ahead of themselves, equities or crypto or otherwise. Everything was out of control. Um, and, and at that point, it became obvious that, you know, start winding down these long positions and, 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 and think about what happens next as, as at some point, interest rates were going to rise. And, and that kind of brought us to the end of, uh, you know, what happened in, in 2022. Um, and, and, and late last year, after everything had crashed, um, I decided to enter, enter the arena on the business side and start Revelo Intel, which is a, a crypto research platform. Um, using some of the tactics and techniques that I developed um, riding the bull run up um, and, and creating products out of them that people uh, would also find useful. Um, we don't give opinions. We don't, um, you know, tell you, give you single signals. We don't give you levels of what to buy and what to sell. It's for people that do their own work, um, like the both of you and me, um, but just embedding tools that allows us to to absorb more information in in less time um, so we launched that february 8th of this year um, it's going great we've got a discord server that's for paying members only we've got um, a a notes product where we cover 230 entities in the crypto space and i have a team of people that follow them whenever they have an ama or a town hall projects chains individual people uh, podcasts and, and we summarize them and we put them on this platform. So instead of having to listen to 10 hours of podcasts a week, um, you could read our notes um, in a tenth of the time and be able just to absorb a lot more information faster. We also do deep dive research on individual projects, 50, 60, 70 page reports. They take ages to do. Um, and they're very, very uh, uh, in-depth. Um, Drake, you've got access. You've had a look. Um, I'm curious to hear what you think about it. But anyway, I've been talking nonstop for 10 or 15 minutes now. Um, but you asked how I got here, so I thought I'd just give you give you the rundown. No, no you're that, good, man. That's perfect. Um, yeah, no, that that's fine. I mean, we, we want to hear about you. Uh, that's the whole point of this uh, episode. But uh, yeah, Revelo Intel, um, just from my experience, I love it. Like, I mean, I... Me being in the DeFi space, I have to consume so much content, uh, so I have to figure out what's going on. And normally, I consume this content like YouTube videos. I'll do 2x speed. Also, while I'm reading um, on Twitter, I'm reading different Medium articles. Like I'm literally doing. I, I have two sets of earbuds. I have one that goes to the computer in one year, one that goes to uh, YouTube. Um, on my phone in the other year and I'm also reading stuff. So in the crypto space, you have to have so much content. And with Revelo Intel, the best way I can put this is it's like listening to YouTube videos on 10x speed. Um, it just gives timestamps <laughs> that are just perfect. Um, that, that's what I like about it. Um, but in general, well, actually, so if you haven't checked out Revelo Intel, you guys can check that out. And Nick will give us some more details at the end of this video. But Nick, I want to ask you a question, man. Um, how do you analyze these projects? Um, I know it's, it's tough to navigate in the DeFi space. And just looking at these different projects, how, how are you able to say like, yeah, that's the one? Or you look at another and you're like, 
Nah, it's trash. Don't touch it. What do you look for? Yeah, so it, it look when you when you try and analyze a publicly listed company, you know where all the information is. Okay, everyone's got a P and L on a balance sheet and a cash flow statement. It's highly regulated. The information is standardized. If you're reading, if you go and research one, um, you know, one restaurant company versus another restaurant company, you can hold their financial statements next to each other, and there is familiarity right? It's the same format. It's the same standard. You can, you can compare the two. Um, so that's what I was used to, right? You know where to find the information. There are quarterly reports. There's an annual report. There are analyst reports. There's the SEC filings. Everyone goes to the same information sources. In DeFi, none of that exists. So um, if you're going to compare one DEX with another DEX, their docs could be completely different. In fact, they always are completely different. Um, in addition to that, there is no regulation at all. Not that I'm a proponent of regulation, but when I'm trying to analyze something, I want everyone to have to give me the same information and it doesn't exist in crypto. So teams can put whatever they want in their docs and they can leave out whatever they want. So that poses a very large problem for people that do deep work to actually try and understand these things instead of just aping into shit coins and hoping for the best. If you're trying to analyze it, um, it is very difficult. So I understand, you know, where your question's coming from. What I do is, um, first of all, I collect all of the information, right? So if you're researching a project, you want to read the white paper, you want to read their docs, you want to listen to um, all the podcasts or interviews that the founders have done, and we do this at Revelo Intel to save you time. Um, I... I go into the Discord. I ask some difficult questions without being a prick. Um, I try to get that information. I try to uh, uh, ask those questions directly to the team, not in the public Discord channels. People get defensive when everyone can see it. You have a little bit more leeway to ask some tougher questions if it's a private one-on-one to conversate, one-on-one conversation. Actually, the reason that 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 I started making videos back in the day and 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 you know and, and building a network in crypto was that. I couldn't get answers. I'd get into discords. I'd ask thoughtful questions um, and any hint of negativity, um, I just got attacked. And, and, and that's bad for a project because you want to be able to uh, answer the tough questions provided that they, are, uh, that they are asked in an articulate and thoughtful way. So what I decided was if I, come, if I become somewhat of a public figure, for lack of a better phrase, and, and I go into a project's discord and I ping one of the team members and I ask them three questions, the chances they get answered go up. So that was the whole reason for, for you know, Nick Drake on appearing um, just a little over a year ago is I couldn't get the information I wanted. So I feel what you feel in terms of the premise of your question. So number one, Drake, is I collect as much information as I can. Then what I do is I synthesize it and I try to work out where the gaps in that information are and I try and get answers to that, whether it's directly asking the team or asking other people that understand that kind of protocol and say, hey, you know, you run a DEX. This is a DEX. Um, they've left this information out of their docs. Why would someone do that? Right? And I'd get other people's opinions. So what effectively what I'm trying to say is you need to read between the lines when you're analyzing a publicly listed company even with all of the disclosures that they give you. In DeFi, you just need to read between the lines at a greater extent because you have less information. It is less reliable. People could be being, could be deceptive. So it, it, it is just not necessarily harder. Um, you just have to do a lot more guesswork. And, and the beauty of that is that creates opportunity because you have a, a, a information asymmetry between the people that do do that work at that level and everybody else, right? Um, If we're going to analyze a publicly listed company, because all of the information is available in terms of you, whether it's me or you, we have the same amount of information available. Um, Even if I'm better than you, the gap in terms of edge that I can generate from a skill level between the two of us is somewhat capped because you have all the information that I have. But in DeFi, 
um, because that information is harder to get or non-existent, we have to infer more from that information. We have to interpret more. And therefore, the gap in skill level that you can generate from an edge perspective is larger. It's a lot more dangerous, but the opportunity is larger. So, I mean, there's no real silver bullet to how do I analyze something. I just try and look for clues. I look for breadcrumbs. I do a lot of work on the team. Um, I, I set a lot of traps for teams. Um, maybe traps is the wrong word, but I will ask questions of the team that I expect an answer that depending on the answer, I can infer A, B, or C, right? Um, if someone's hiding something, there is a set of questions that you can, a you can ask them and they are always going to answer them in a certain way. And therefore, you can use that information to avoid that project altogether. Um, you look for red flags and sometimes you need to manufacture them. Um, what I mean, not manufacture them, is you need to kind of um, uh, 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 set a path right? So that that red flag can present itself because people will try and be deceptive. Um, the good news is that, you know, some of these projects are becoming more mature, um, two, three years old, um, because a lot of bad things have happened and they'll continue to happen. The bar for disclosure, the bar for information is increasingly getting higher and higher. So we're getting more information. Teams can get away with fewer shenanigans. Um, expectations increase. So there is more to analyze the, for, the further we go. Um, you know, it's a very nascent industry. And when it's a nascent industry, people are going to try and cheat. People are going to um, try and pull off shady shit. But also, people are just not very good at what they're doing. And it just, as an industry. So it takes time for these things to develop and to become more sophisticated. Um, we just brought... Um, a guy onto the Revelo Intel team uh, by the name of Suvlaki. He worked at Beethoven on Phantom, which is a the the the, the friendly balancer fork um, on on Phantom a, a Dex. And 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 this guy, um, you know, has fifteen years experience working at the big four accounting firms of Morgan Stanley. And what he was doing at Beethoven was financial reporting. So Beethoven really, um, you know, was a or still is. A, a a pioneer of sorts in financial reporting disclosures for a DeFi protocol. They did an annual report that, that looked very much like an annual report that you would read for a listed company. Um, so we brought him on, on onto the Revelo team so that we can build out a financial reporting business um, where we can analyze these projects and put out quarterly, monthly, yearly reports, looking at the metrics, trying to um, you know collect data that people don't collect interpret the data, present the data, and, and, and you know, present insights. All of this kind of flows into your question, which is how do we analyze these things when, when, when it's a jungle out there? And, and the, answer, the short answer is with great difficulty, but huge opportunities if you can do the work, if you know where to look. And I expect over time, um, we think it's a fantastic business. That's why we've entered into the financial reporting business. But over time, we're going to see a lot more standardized reporting from serious DeFi protocols that will give people like you and I um, more information to analyze, more reliable information to analyze. Because you can fudge what's in the docs, right? With PR talk and fluff and, and marketing speak, but you can't fluff the data. It's on chain, right? All you need to do is pull it, um, organize it, present it, and comment on it to get tons of value out of it. So I'll pause there. Hope, hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, you, you did. Um, and and that's, I think that's really important to understand and uh, what you were saying a couple minutes ago about um, asking those difficult questions. Um, for you, uh, for example, what are some of those difficult questions that you would ask? Like what are just like one or two um, examples of a difficult question that way? Uh, some of our viewers will be able to uh, practice that in the Discord to be able to um, spot out uh, the uh, the good from the bad. So generally, um, when you ask someone how they make their money, right, um, and 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 they're asking you to invest, right. So you know, I do a lot of seed investing, um, crypto or otherwise. 
And, and if a founder comes to me and says, look, I want you to invest in my project. Here's my idea. Um, this is how everything works. I, 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 a lot of my questions uh, revolve around, great, how does the business make money? And part of that is, great, how do you make money? Okay, so, and, 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 and then I can infer how I can make my money back as an investor. So in DeFi, when you ask a project, any questions related about, you know, how the team makes their money and how much they make, um, you have teams that go, yeah, you know, this is how we do it. We've got a team allocation. It's 20% of fees. This is what it looks like. This is, and, and they just tell you. When you've got other founders or team members that get really defensive, right? And their, their, their answer is kind of like, you know, stop fighting the project. This isn't, you know, or this isn't your business or anything like that. I run for my life, right? Because why, what's the problem with me asking a project how they plan to fund operations, which is how do you guys pay yourselves? Where's that money coming from, right? That is an important question for an investor to ask. And let's just be clear. If you're shilling me your token to buy it, right? Or if you're trying to convince me to buy a token in a project, you're trying to convince me to invest in the project. So as an investor, right? I would be stupid not to try and understand how the value flows through that system, right? How does the protocol make money? How does the team make money? How do the users make money? Where does that money come from? And ultimately, how do I as an investor get my money back? So when you ask, and this happens a lot in DeFi, any kind of question that touches the team allocation, if they get defensive, just run. Because there's no reason to be defensive if, if you are a, a sophisticated operator and you plan to run that thing like a business. If you get kind of worried about disclosing what the team makes, when you're asking people to invest in the project, it's nuts. It's like if you come, Drake, if, if, if you've got a startup idea and you come to me and say, hey, Nick, I've got this idea. It's cool. I want to raise half a million bucks so that I can go and build it. Um, uh, you know, would you like to invest? And I say, cool. Okay, Drake, how much are you going to pay yourself? If I give you the 500, how are you going to spend the 500? That's not an offensive question for me to ask you. You're going to say, well, you're going to put in 500. I'm going to take 100 grand and pay this developer. I'm going to take 100 grand and spend it on marketing. I need 50 grand for admin. And I'm going to take a salary of 60 grand a year. That's how that conversation should go. So when you, when you ask a protocol to explain the team allocation and they get defensive, I don't get it. Why the fuck are you getting defensive? Maybe you're doing something shady. So that's that's one broad area that I would um that I would that that, that generates concern for me. Another area is when you're quizzing the the, the 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 protocol about the numbers, right? So trying to understand how value flows through the system, not specifically to the team allocation, but let's say, great, okay, so you've got this system. Explain to me how um, one dollar of profit is generated from for the protocol, right? Explain to me the numbers like I'm a five year old. Show me how users make money. Show me how investors make money, and show me how everyone in between can make money. Just run me through the numbers like I'm a five year old. And if that conversation kind of gets convoluted, and they start talking about jargon. And they start, you know, using language that is very fluffy and very marketing speak. If they're trying to talk about, you know, um, uh, anything that doesn't revolve around how that dollar moves through the system, it shows me they don't understand the mechanics of how value is going to flow through that system. Maybe they are very good at marketing and very bad at business. Maybe they are very good technically, but they are very bad at business. I'm trying to work out how good they are at business. And if you can't explain to me, you know, how you're going to make money, then that's a red flag to me that you don't know what you're doing. And if you don't know what you're doing, you're not going to get my money. Like, you know, if you run a hamburger shop, you want a burger joint, Drake, and I come to you and I say, explain to me how this thing makes money. You explain it. Well, I've got my food cost. I've got my wages cost. I've got my staff cost. And I've got my overhead, which is my rent, my electricity, etc. Okay, I, 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 I 
buy, uh, you know, my food cost me 33% of turnover. My wages cost me 33% of turnover. And my overhead is 20%. And my burger joint should net 10 to 13% every year in net profit. Now you've explained to me how the fuck you make money as a burger joint. If you can't do that as a DeFi protocol, then you don't know what the hell you're doing. And I'm out. Make sense? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, I think, uh, especially in DeFi, uh, focusing on earnings and if the protocol is able to generate revenue is huge. Um, and that's, that's, that's great uh, that you go into the Discord and ask those questions. Um, some people say they're difficult questions, but they're really not difficult questions. They're just oh. questions that are difficult to ask. Um, because some people may be embarrassed by the backlash of what's going to happen. In my opinion, what's more embarrassing is investing in it and then just getting hammered because you didn't simply ask the embarrassing question or at least one that was thought to be embarrassing and save yourself a bunch of money. Um, yeah. uh, heart, or Abs, you got any uh, thoughts on that? No, yeah. I mean, I've I've been booted from several discords just because I was asking very simple questions like, you know, uh, exactly. The number one would be like, I don't I don't understand this, you know, this tokenomics. What, can you break down this piece of, you know, tokenomics for me? And then literally the mod and the uh, the devs and the, the team leads and then the folks that are in general chat just literally attack and then you get banned <laughs> without <laughs> anything, with, you know, without any explanation whatsoever. So that's obviously, yeah, no, you know, no you problem. said it right. It's, it's a red flag. Exactly. Ab, abs, when that happens, right, you dodge the fucking mm -hmm. bullet. You Absolutely. dodge the bullet. Yeah. Be, 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 because anyone that runs their business like that, look, there's a misconception around, around DeFi that protocols are something other than a fucking business. It's mm -hmm. a business. What you're trying to do is make money, right? And, and, and if you can't answer those questions, then, and you start, you know, banning people for doing it, no problem. The world's a big place. There's thousands of DeFi protocols. You take your money and you go elsewhere. Here's the flip side of this equation, guys. If you have a project that can answer those questions, right, that does have these healthy debates in their Discord, that does have mods that are adults and not mouth-breathing idiots, right? If you have the opposite of what we're talking about, right, the confidence in that project from sophisticated people that can tie their, that can tie their shoelaces um, increases. So when you have those projects that are defensive about these questions, they self-select for their investor base. They end up having the lowest IQ investors in DeFi because no one smart will hang around in that environment. Okay. So what happens is if anything goes wrong in that, in that particular protocol, the investor base, because they're in it without understanding it, they flee in the first five minutes because they don't know what's going on. They see the number go down, they panic, they're out. But if you have a project that has good disclosures, has very smart founders, has very smart mods, they can articulate situations, they can communicate well, they operate in a sophisticated way, they self-select for their investor base to be knowledgeable, to be high IQ, to be very communicative. So that investor base is more likely to stick with that project for the long term, right? So it's not just a matter of, um, you know, uh, 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 where you're going to put your money. You think about where other smart people are going to put their money. And they're not going to put it in a, in, in, in a protocol that behave like a bunch of five-year-olds. So kind of what I'm saying is, you know, um, there's smart money and there's dumb money. You want to be with the smart money. And smart money doesn't hang around in an environment where questions don't get answered. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a very strong signal and it's a very kind of intuitive way to end up in situations with other smart people. Because, um, you know, smart people don't hang around in those spots. So it self-selects for itself. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, I th just one ahead, more thing ahead. off of that. Yeah. So I was thinking, you really want to have that retention number and the percentages of your customers that come back. Like that's obviously it, right? Like if you're thinking about it from a business perspective, that's that's completely right. What you're saying, 
You want your, your, your customers to come back to that burger joint. You want them to order this and that. You want them to have some type of, you know, return that's, you know, satisfying to them. And you want them to be repeat customers. Like, simple as that. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Great formula. Yeah, and yeah. I think also adding on there is knowing what the project does best and uh, drive revenue from this. Um, like, I see a lot of this happen all the time with a lot of forks. Um, a prominent example of this is a GMX fork. If you look in to see where their revenue is coming from or their earnings are coming from, if it's coming from swaps instead of leverage trading, that's not actual earnings. Like that is, it, I mean, of course you can do leverage trading and you can wash trade with it, but a perp dex is supposed to get most of its revenue from um, leverage trading. To whereas if you're getting it from swaps, it's just acting like a dex. And if it's mostly coming from deck, uh, a DEX, that's mostly people that are just depositing into the GLP farm or whatever that um, GMX uh, form or um, token is called the, in the form of GLP. It's just people farming that token and there's no real uh, revenue or earnings there. So I think the next question I want to go into, Nick, is... What projects are you looking at now? I'm sure you've had your uh, finger on the pulse, um, just seeing what's out there and looking at different projects. And I'm sure you've accumulated several different projects uh, throughout this uh, dip that we have. And um, we're, in my opinion, we're still somewhat in uh, a, a bear situation. So I think it's still a accumulator season. I'm just curious what you're looking at right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that I do things, Drake, is I do it from the top down. So what I mean by that is, first, I need to have a macro view. I need to try and yeah. understand what regime, what environment we are operating in. And based on that view, I then decide, um, you know, I go down and I look at, okay, so what sectors are interesting? what kind of asset classes perform well in this regime. And then I kind of, you know, follow, follow the breadcrumbs down. Now, I've been bearish um, the crypto market uh, for the better part of a year, um, for good reason. <clears throat> and, and that was very, very obvious in 2022, even without the blowups that happened, right? Um, interest rates going up, was a very predictable thing. Um, and so as a result, because my view, and, and when I say my view, I am, I am trying to develop ideas and generate trade ideas that have a one to three month duration. Um, so my view is within that lens, right? So I'm trying to predict what's gonna happen over the next three to six months and then place trades accordingly. So when I'm bearish um, over a, you know, one to six month period, then individual projects um, on the DeFi front are not very attractive at all for obvious reason, right? Because um, they're just not going to do very well. They don't trade on their own merits, right? They trade on the back of what the broader crypto market is going to do. So, you know, if you're looking at a specific project or a specific set of projects that has the, that have the characteristics that you think will make very good businesses and you're trying to trade them or buy them when the overhanging outlook, macro outlook is bearish, that's not a good use of capital because they're just not going to move, right? It's not like, um, you know, you investing in a in a particular tech company um when you know the market's a little shaky yeah it probably goes down with the market but if that company comes out with earnings and blows them away and show shows 50 60 percent year-on-year growth with earnings going through the roof bear market or not it catches a bid unfortunately in DeFi, yeah because, that's, that's a good point yeah so Unfortunately, in DeFi, because it's such a small asset class, right? And because these tokens, let's just be honest, are illiquid shitcoins for the most part. They're very illiquid. 
right? And because you don't have a lot of sophisticated capital to move the markets, the project doesn't move. So my view on DeFi is, you know, I want to increase my exposure to individual DeFi projects when I believe the, that we are operating in an accommodative macro outlook because that's when these things can catch a bid and that's when they can outperform. But in the current environment, right, um, any kind of outperformance is very short-lived. You, you can still do it. Like, for example, over the last three months, one of the narratives, and, and again, let's just be honest, a lot of these token prices move primarily on narratives. They don't move on cash flows. They don't move on revenue. They don't move on anything other than people piling into them because they expect other people to pile into them. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't have any, I don't, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that. But a project doesn't really catch a bid on the fundamentals. It catches a bid because everybody's talking about it. One example is over the last three months is the solidly forks. Um, so, you know, a good friend of mine, Dr. Liquid, started Thena on, on BSC. Um, and, and I was there when he came up with the idea late last year. Um, it puts the thing together and, and that's outperformed the market greatly. All of the solidly forks have, um, except for the ETH version for other reasons. But, you know, there are pockets where you can make some money in a bear market, obviously, but they are few and far between and they are extremely dangerous because the ask can fall out of these illiquid tokens very, very quickly. So when I do do that, and I don't really want to bring up any individual projects um, and, 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 and discuss them in, in, in too much depth, other than, you know, uh, uh, there's a time to, to play the DeFi token game and there's a time not to. Now is probably the time not to, um, just because of so much uncertainty in terms of what happens next. There's uncertainty in the economy, guys, right? Um, you know, you've got banks failing, you've got inflate, global inflation is actually rising. Food, in, The delta between food inflation and the CPI is getting larger, which means poorer people are getting much poorer. That leads to a lot of unhealthy outcomes for, for, for those economies. Um, and, and, and so you've got this kind of bleak outlook for 2023 from an economic standpoint and, and an interest rate environment. And then you layer on top of that, all of the headwinds that crypto faces specifically, you know, we're on Twitter all day. We can see, um, you know, a lot of the theories that have been throwing around operation choke, choke point. Um, the banking sector is, is, is being pressured into not banking crypto. Like, if even half of these stories are true and the government is trying to shut down this industry, that's fucking bearish, right? Short term, that's bearish. That's not good news. So um, kind of a long-winded way of saying um, I'd be spending a lot more time trying to work out, you know, the macro type environment, whether it's crypto or otherwise, and less time trying to pick winners and losers in the individual token space only because they just move in unison with what the greater market does. Um, that changes very quickly. Um, so, you know, I'm spending a lot more time thinking about um, the, 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 the macro view and a lot less time trying to pick individual projects. I'm still keeping up to date with everything. There's still things that I'm bullish on. There's still things that I'm bearish on. Um, but it's just very difficult to put on any kind of coherent trade in the current market environment that isn't going to move with the market, right? Um, it, it, it's extremely difficult. Yeah, that makes sense. And I agree with that. Um, Cause I mean, why would someone oh, want to be trading um, some Bitcoin, some ETH, or even some of these altcoins if they can't even put food on the table? Um, so basically there goes your earnings type of thing. Um, I guess um, another question, since we're kind of talking about macro, is what are your thoughts about what's going on? I'm sure you, I don't know if you saw or not, um, but it looks like uh, Credit Suisse uh, is, could potentially be another bank uh, that we see falling. Um, SVB Bank, uh, 
was the bank that basically collapsed this weekend. And uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, a, there was a rippling effect in the market with that, uh, with a lot of the smaller banks uh, being hit this week in uh, TradFi. And we're starting to see this with um, other banks as well, starting to get hit. Like the contagion seems to be going around. What What are your thoughts on uh, what's going on? Like, what's what what should the viewers be doing? Like, how should we play this? It it is it's not good. Okay, um, it's not good for a number of reasons. There's a lot of things we don't know. Um, and there's some things that we know for sure. I like to start with the things that we know for sure. Um, you mentioned Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse has been a shit show for the better part of a decade, right? Um, but it's also designated a, um, a globally important or glo globally systemically, no, global systemically important bank, GSIB, right? There is a designation. There's a list. You can Google it. Um, and what that means is effectively too big to fail, right? So um, uh, uh, Credit Suisse is on that list. It's been, it's, it, it, it's been the walking dead for a really long time. Deutsche Bank is in the same position. A lot of the European banks are in the same position. So whether Credit Suisse folds or not, I don't know. Um, but let's go back to what we do know. Here's what we know. Inf inflation is going to remain above the Fed's target, okay? Inflation, like everyone got euphoric yesterday because the inflation print came in at 6%, okay? And, and, and you know, markets pumped, then they dumped. But 6% inflation is a fucking disaster. It's less of a disaster than it was last month. But 6% inflation is an absolute disaster for the economy, okay? Um, and, and, and traders, uh, because they have shorter term durations, uh, uh, are seeing it as a bullish signal in that if inflation continues to slow, at some point, the Fed is going to pivot. Um, I've got news for you guys. The Fed is not going to cut interest rates this year. It's just not going to happen. Not going to happen. So celebrating a 6% print, sure. That's better than 6.5%, but it's still a disaster for the economy. What else do we know? We know that GDP is going to be negative quarter on quarter for Q1 and Q2, okay? So that is a, a recessionary environment, right? When GDP goes down. So that's a fact. That's going to happen. Now, contrary to popular opinion, Jay Powell is not a fucking idiot. Okay? I know the memes. I know we like memeing about him on, on Twitter. But this is a guy that's made an absolute fortune in private equity. He understands financial markets, right? He understands the history of the financial markets. And he does not want to stop tightening too early, like in the 80s, right? He understands what levers he can pull and what levers and buttons he can push, okay? Now, he's explicitly told us multiple times that inflation is their focus and they are not going to stop raising rates until inflation is under control. So this is something we know. If you go back and you read everything that he's put out before he was Fed chair and during being Fed chair, this is a guy that does not want to go down in the history books as fucking this up, okay? So what else do we know? <clears throat> the Fed has been relying primarily on the labor market to tell them when to stop tightening, okay? Because they've told us this. This is not, we're not guessing. I, 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 I'm sticking to what we know, not what Nick thinks. The, the first three things I said, we know. We also know that they're focusing on the labor market, okay? They've mentioned many, many times that, um, you know, the labor market needs to get hit before inflation goes down. You cannot escape the laws of economics, okay? You cannot have inflation go down while you have low unemployment. 
It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. There are certain laws, right, in physics, in economics. This is one of them. In order for inflation to go down, unemployment needs to go up, right? Because that's, that is how you end up in a deflationary environment, right? When people lose their jobs, while you have everybody employed and earning money, they continue to spend money, right? You, you, you've heard the term demand destruction. The easiest way to get demand destruction is for people to lose their jobs. Now, a lot of people have been losing their jobs, but most of them have been high paying tech sector jobs. These people have savings. These people have investments. These people are highly skilled. They probably work it out. But eventually, you're going to see unemployment go up. So the Fed has told us that they're relying on the labor market to signal to them when to stop tightening. Unemployment is not going up, guys. Okay? That, that's a fact. Next. Historically, and you can go and look this up, is the stock market doesn't bottom when the Fed starts to cut rates. That's not when it bottoms. It bottoms sometime after that, right? And you can go and have a look at what happened in every recession prior to this one. There is a very large lag when you get this shock, okay? The, the, the Fed changes their interest rate policy, okay? You get this bounce because everyone thinks, okay, the worst is over, the Fed's going to save us. And then somewhere between six to 18 months after that, the ass falls out of the market because corporate earnings dictate what stock prices do. And corporate earnings don't flip quarter to quarter when the interest rates stop being cut, right? It hits corporate earnings somewhere between six to 18 months later. So what else do we know? Bear Stearns, when it failed on March 16th in 2008, was the fifth largest bank, okay? You would think that was the bottom of the market. March 16th, 2008, Drake. The market actually bottomed on March 9th of 2009, 12 months later, after the fifth largest bank in the US failed. So this goes back to the point that I just said, where, you know, it takes time for the negativity in the economy to show itself in corporate earnings. And despite what happens day to day, the S&P and stock prices track corporate earnings, corporate profitability, okay? Now, Silicon Valley Bank, I don't know which list we want to look at, but it was somewhere between the 15th or the 18th largest bank in the US when it failed on March 9th, okay, of this year. So, <laughs> you know, when do you expect the stock market to bottom? If you think it's bottom now, well, you're fucking wrong. Because that's never happened before in the history of the way that these recessionary economies develop. Um, we know all these things. These are not my opinion. The other thing that we know is that the two to 10 spread, so the difference between the two year bond and the 10 year bond, remains inverted at negative 45 basis points. That's really bad, right? For, for what it means for the economy. And therefore, what it means for the equity market. And therefore, what it means for the crypto market. So, you know, I mean, let's kind of circle back here. I don't know what, um, I don't know how we get there. But what I do know, based on how these things always develop, is that um, we have not bottomed. We might have a 20% rally. I mean, You've got recessions where the market goes 20, 30% up before it comes all the way back down and bottoms. In fact, that's usually what happens because everyone is trying to front run what's going to happen. But you cannot outrun, you cannot outsmart the laws of economics. And, and when you have a high interest rate environment and a low unemployment environment and, and all of these different factors that are at play together, Banks failing, um, civil unrest, um, you know, you've got an election year coming up next year. All these things um, 
together make for a melting pot of uncertainty. Markets do not like uncertainty. And 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 my view is, um, you know, I've got a bearish outlook, but you know, I I I try and ride the bounces up and down. Um, but my view is that the ass is going to fall out of the equity market um, at some point this year, uh, probably in Q2 or Q3. Uh, and, 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 and at that point, when the, when the ass falls out of the market, that's when you're probably potentially going to see the Fed pivot, if you like, and stop cutting rates <clears throat> towards the end of the year. So, you know, it is a very uncertain environment. These banks failing is, is, is you know, is not good. A year ago, <clears throat> when the Fed started, started raising rates um, on some of the podcasts that I do, you know, I kept repeating myself, when you raise rates this quickly, um, things break. I don't know what's going to break, but there are a hundred different things that can break. Things are going to break and we're not going to know what breaks for six to 12 months because that's how long it takes for these mechanisms and these dynamics and these conflicts to develop. And we just saw the first thing to break, you know, being the duration mismatch that all of these banks have suffered because they gambled on long duration assets. Um, they made a big bet on rates not going up. Rates went up. And now they're stuck with these unrealized losses on the HTM portion of their bond portfolio. And they ended up with a liquidity crunch. You, you, you layer on a bank run, those deposits get called, and you have three large banks that just went under. So that's something that broke because interest rates went up so quickly. It is not the only thing that broke. But Nick, what else broke? I don't know, guys. But other things have broken, and they're going to keep coming out as the stress in the system builds and builds and builds and the Fed tries to fight it off and the government tries to fight it off. And it's just going to be this seesawing battle between the laws of economics and physics and government intervention trying to stop the chaos. Um, and there's trading opportunities there. So buckle up, folks. It's going to be a bumpy ride and, um, and there's ways to make money both to the upside and the downside. But if you're going to be a perma long, a perma bull in 2023, um, you are going to have an absolute fucking nightmare. A perma wreck. <laughs> it's going to be hard, man. I'm not saying you can't make money to the upside, but, um, you know, the Fed is just not going to stop raising rates. They've told us they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. You just had banks fail. They're going to raise rates in March. They're going to raise 25 basis points, maybe 50. Three fucking banks just failed. So what's it going to take for them to stop raising rates if they're not going to do it now? They can't stop raising rates. They're already, they understand that these things are breaking because of all this stress in the system. So anyway, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting yeah. mix. No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, I, liked your, I liked your comment you made about Bear Stearns. Um, I tweeted about this a couple of days ago as well. But um, if we go back in history, uh, Bear Stearns actually collapsed around this time in uh, March 2008. Or, yeah, wait, was it 2000? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. it was 2008. So they collapsed in 2008. Uh, JP Morgan Chase ended up buying them out. And if you go on the chart on the S&P 500, when they were basically bought out, they collapsed, whatever. S&P was trading at around 1291, just call it 1300. And this was in March. However, uh, Lehman Brothers, they ended up collapsing a few months later in September. And in September, right before they collapsed or around that collapsing time, the S&P 500 was trading around 1200. So basically after they collapsed, September 15th, 2008, that's when the markets literally just dumped and they finally reached the um, bottom on in, in March 2009, which is basically the next year, around 671 on the S&P 500. So basically, we dropped another 50%. Um, and that's just kind of the same situation we're looking at right now. 
Um, not financial <laughs> advice, of course, but it'll be interesting to see what happens because immediately after uh, the Bear Stearns collapse, the market, well, after they were bought by JP Morgan, they ended up uh, pumping for about two or three months, um, increasing from a, around 1300 to about 1400 So like, like Nick was saying, um, yeah, there's a chance that the market does get a rally and uh, people trying to front run it, but <laughs> you can't really um, fade economic cycles or uh, fix them just by predicting what will happen. So obviously, time will tell. We'll see what happens. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do agree with the thoughts uh, that you're uh, let, speaking, Nick. And let me add uh, something it's interesting of, to hear that perspective. Let me add something on top of what you just said. So the reason we're in this mess, okay, is too much money entering the system, too much liquidity entering the system. It leads to malinvestment. It leads to bad decisions. It leads to folks taking on more risk than they should. That's the consequence. That's the symptom of easy money, of a lot of liquidity in the system. And that is the reason some of these banks are, are failing. Okay. So if your bullish thesis is that, well, because some of these banks are going to fail, the Fed's going to turn back on the money printer. And that's bullish. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right? The reason we're in this mess is that, sure, you're going to pump some liquidity into the system and that will give you short-term relief. But all you've done is made the problem bigger. So then the, 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 the impending collapse is going to be harder and faster. So, you know, it, it, the, 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 it's kind of like layer one thinking to think, oh, okay, good. Bad news is good news because the Fed needs to start printing money again and we're all going to be rich. That's, that's literally level one thinking. You've got to go to level two and say, okay, what are the consequences? What are the second and third order effects if the Fed starts printing money with the CPI at 6%? What happens next? What happens six months later? What happens 12 months later? And the answer is, whatever's going on now, Amplify it by a multiple, by an order of an order of magnitude. Okay, so that's that's not you don't need a PhD in economics to understand that. We are in this scenario because we printed too much money, and that creates bad outcomes. That needs to be sucked out of the system. Businesses need to fail. Okay, people need to go bankrupt. Unemployment needs to go up. And it's not lost on me that this is bad for a lot of people. We're just talking about this from an intellectual standpoint as participants in the financial markets. I don't want people to lose money. I don't want people to lose their businesses, right? So let's just make that clear. But in order for the economy to come back to a normalized scenario, there needs to be that pain. If you stop that pain and you put a Band-Aid on it and you plug that leak before it has had its time to heal fully and the practical you know, uh, uh, way of saying that is if you start printing money while, while the CPI is still at 5 or 6%, that is an absolute disaster. The Fed knows this, okay? Because they're not idiots. They're in this mess because of certain mistakes. Um, so yeah, you know, it's going, to be, it's going to be a roller coaster. Yo, Nick, I... I, I... I, there's lots of unpack there what you were saying and just to kind of go back from from what you were saying initially about the macro I, I focus primarily on the macro uh, and and uh, I obviously do a little degen things with uh, with DeFi of course uh, which is why we have this podcast but um, yeah going back to the macro the reason why I have this thesis as well this time last year and I think it was a little earlier than that I sold my entire uh, Bitcoin bag, my DeFi bags, everything. I liquidated everything when it was de uh, December of 2021. And because I looked at the charts and if the monthly was going to close and the yearly was going to close, it was going to be bad signs. I, I saw that the strength was weakening. I saw that the we made a we made a, uh, a higher higher in the price action and a lower low in the strength. That was pretty much my my indication to get the hell out. Like everything that I was looking at was just bad news. Total DeFi, total uh, market cap of crypto, total two, excluding Bitcoin, um, total three, excluding Ethereum, uh, the VIX. I looked at the dollar index, which I look at basically every single day now. Um, 
So you kind of get this combination of several different indicators and just marry the two together. And then what do you see happening? Like what you're saying about inflation, as soon as they started kicking in last year in March, that was basically that, that was the start of everything. And I basically sold having I sold everything in December of 2021. And my thesis was, hey, we're going to be entering a recession. And I was calling for a Q3, a Q4 recession of 2022. And I was obviously wrong, but like it takes a long time. I didn't realize that it takes a long time for the recession to actually kick in fully. And if they do, it's you know, go back to the point where they're going to try to print more money because, hey, we're at 6% inflation. This is great. We're all should be celebrating. No, the, the, the bulls that are out there in crypto Twitter, the bulls that are out there in YouTube, they're dead wrong. You, you have no idea what the effects are yet. That's going to come like when is going to be our lehman brothers moment who's the, who's going to be the lehman brothers moment like who's going to be that that bank that's going to completely wreck the entire the, the entire space we need this great reset and just rip the band-aid off already like that's that's my standpoint it, literally you're kicking the can down the road and you know potentially if they continue to continuously to, to go down that path to print more money hyperinflation right it's it's just horrible. It's horrible. It's but you know it's it's not popular in this space to be a, a bear, right? You don't get you don't get likes. You don't get uh you know uh, you know more traction. You don't get more traffic to, to your your Twitter accounts or your your YouTube because it's not it's not sexy to be a bear, right? <laughs> yep. So it's just it's just the way it is. The reality is is that the macro is terrible. But what can we do? Right to combat that is to accumulate right slowly for the you know for the everyday investor for the everyday person that wants to throw in a little bit a little bit here and a little bit of there that's completely fine if you're looking at like a long term you know three five ten years time frame horizon like that's 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 the game that's the game safe money it's it's BTC and ETH like those are that's your bread and butter that should be your bread and butter from here on out until the next happening the bull cycle you know the 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 Bitcoin happening. And then the bull cycle will be triggered somewhat between that time. And if this issue, the macro, you know, seeps into that, hey, more time for you to accumulate these two. The, the gold and the silver of crypto, like this is it, like the, the blue chips. Um, during that time frame, as soon as the happening kicks in, you, wait a, you generally wait a few months. And then around September, October of that same exact year is typically when the markets will, okay, then start creeping back up again. And we're kind of in the clear, but you know, BTC has never experienced a a bear cycle, right? No, a, a recession before. The mother of all bear cycles. So this is quite concerning. Um, I follow um, uh, crypto savvy a whole bunch. He's been calling and he's been calling for the the for BTC potentially to be around you know seven thousand, ten thousand dollars BTC uh, profits. Blue on Twitter. He's been screaming about that. Uh, Chapo or Capo, whatever he's he's been a, a bear as well. I'm in the same boat. I believe these guys. The tech, the, the the research that I've done in the, you know, currently and in the past, it's all saying the same exact thing as these guys are saying. And um, it's just not sexy to be a bear, and it's that's the reality of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I, I don't know about specific levels or anything like that, but you know, the 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 beautiful thing about financial markets is you can make money in both directions. Um, you know, I, I run a long and short book, both in equities and in crypto, which means that most of the time, um, I have an equal amount of exposure to the long side as I do to the downside. And what I'm looking for is for, you know, my longs to go up more than my shorts and my shorts to go down more than my longs. So the way that I do it is, you know, um, it's a lot more complicated than a things going up or things going down. What I'm trying to do is make money if things go up and if things go down. So, um, you know, it, it, I basically operate like a hedge fund would operate. There are times where I might be five or 10% net short or five or 10% net long. But um, I don't take these huge directional bets because I can't hedge out my risk. I've got a very large capital base. I've worked my ass off for my money. And I, I, I have no desire to, to roll the dice on what price Bitcoin's going to be in six months. So I just do it a little differently. Um, but I certainly have 
have had a, a bearish bias um, for, you know, from about November 2022, a little bit later, um, just because rates are going up. And I've seen this thing before, and I understand how markets react. And, you know, all crypto is, is just another way to express some of the views that I might had might have. Bitcoin is an interesting one because in addition to um, it being a risk on asset, right? The same way that equities might be, um, it also has this, you know, overhanging aura on it that it is the hedge against the world going to shit, right? Um, if it's guns in the streets, if it's civil unrest, if it's revolution, if it's the collapse of the global fiat system, if it's the collapse of the, the global banking industry, if these apocalyptic events happen, Bitcoin becomes the thing. We hope. I don't know. I'm not convinced. But um, it's certainly the front runner in terms of what might survive some of those things that are going to happen. So, you know, when you see Bitcoin catch a bid um, in the last few days, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I, put a, I put a tweet out on Friday when, so we knew Silvergate started winding out operations on Wednesday last week. And then on Friday, we knew that SVB got shut down. And, and Bitcoin <clears throat> didn't move. About 20K, 20 and a half, whatever it was. But it didn't move. And I put out a tweet that said, you know, um, you have, you have uh, banks failing, okay? And USDC, which is a pillar of DeFi and the crypto space, um, depegging. So that's not working. And Bitcoin didn't move. Whereas you would expect that as some of this thesis plays out, which is the collapse of the global fiat system and the global banking sector, Bitcoin should be through the roof. I remember, so let's go back into history. So Bitcoin was invented in 2008 during the GFC. Satoshi embedded that message in the first block um, from the Chancellor of Germany, which was basically, you know, signaled that this economic environment is good for Bitcoin, and it was invented in that environment. In 2013, the, the, the banks in Cyprus, I now live in Cyprus um, for tax reasons, but I didn't at the time, the banks in Cyprus went bankrupt. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember or if you've read about it, but let me tell you what happened. There were four large banks in Cyprus. It's a small, small island, a million people, but a lot of the world's money comes here for taxation reasons and for some shady reasons as well. But there's a lot of capital here for a small island. And you had a lot of Russian billionaires, a lot of dirty money, a lot of criminal money, but also a lot of legitimate money, billions and billions of dollars sitting in Cypriot banks. And these banks um, went bust. And they went bust because... They were giving loans on real estate that they shouldn't have even been giving on. Everyone could get a loan. There was a lot of shady shit going on. You buy a piece of land for a million dollars. You pay the bank manager 50K and he'd lend you $3 million on this $1 million piece of land. So there was a lot of shenanigans going on that ended up with these banks holding paper that was worthless. The banks go under. Similar to what happened in the US in the GFC. A very similar kind of thing. So as these banks go under, E Cyprus is, in, is part of the EU. The EU looks at all of these bank accounts and all of these people that had the money in there and they said, great. So 100,000 euros for each account holder is insured by the EU, similar to what the FDIC does, okay? Anything over 100,000, the EU is going to take, I think it was like 8.6%. It was called the haircut, actually called the haircut. So all depositors in Cypriot banks with over 100,000 in an account had 8.6% or whatever, don't quote me on the number, but it's you know, some high single digit number taken from them, period. Actually taken from them. And a lot of that money was belonged to you know, Russian billionaires and a lot of very wealthy people, but that actually happened, right? 
So similar to what happened now in Silicon Valley Bank, except instead of backstopping it, anyone that had more than, than the, the insured amount, they got taxed on it. And they used that money to recapitalize two of the banks. They let two banks go under and they recapitalized the other two with the money that they took from people. This happened. When that happened, Bitcoin went parabolic because, you know, the promise of Bitcoin was that these motherfuckers are going to take our money at some point. Your money in the bank is not safe. The government can come in and take it when it wants. And the EU, an EU country, not some country that we've never heard of, this was an EU nation. And the EU sanctioned it and they took people's money and Bitcoin went parabolic. So on Friday, when Bitcoin didn't catch a bid, right? Didn't go up at all. Not 5%, not 10%. It didn't go up at all. I'm thinking to myself, why? And, and you know, I kind of came to the conclusion that there's a lot of baggage around Bitcoin um, revolving what happened into, in 2022 with all these, you know, FTX and all this other crap. You know, the, 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 the aura around Bitcoin got faded because of all the shenanigans that happened outside of Bitcoin that are related to crypto. And it didn't catch a bid, but um, it did catch a bid yesterday, right? And, and, and late on Sunday. And the reason that it caught a bid isn't because some people think that interest rates might stop going up. It caught a bid because people started realizing, you know what, guys? They backstopped this bank and depositors are going to keep their money, but they easily could not have. They easily could not have. And if they didn't, or if banks in Europe or if banks in Australia and the UK start failing and those governments don't backstop deposits, you have the same situation that you had in Cyprus. So Bitcoin is very interesting because it has these characteristics that it could potentially decouple from everything else. I don't think it has yet. I don't know if it will. But it's super interesting from an intellectual standpoint to think about that, that the, 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 the bull thesis for Bitcoin is that it is the one thing that we can self-custody that they can't take. Forget about, you know, the sailor bull thesis and the volcanoes and, you know, corporations putting it on their balance sheet and all of those other narratives, the inflation hedge, all those narratives have been invalidated, right? None of that shit worked <laughs> because Bitcoin went down with everything else last year. But the one thing that hasn't been invalidated is it, it is literally one of the few things that we can own that the governments can't touch. They can limit how we use it, and they're trying, right, by cutting off the on-ramps and the off-ramps. But it does have that pristine characteristic that um, it's fully decentralized. You can't turn it off. You can't seize it. You can't stop it. That part has not been invalidated. Um, so anyway, I, I, I pause there. It, it's an interesting intellectual exercise to kind of revisit the Bitcoin, um, the Bitcoin uh, uh, narrative around it is the only thing they can't touch. And it's good to see it catch a bid um, because guys, I'm looking at where my assets are distributed and I have assets around the world. Um, I've been at this for a long time. So, you know, I, I, I was pretty rich before Bitcoin, you know, before crypto and, and I'm looking at all these things and I've got to tell you, there are very few things that I own <laughs> that someone can't come and take. <laughs> so we have to revisit all these things. And I've, I've got money at Goldman Sachs and I've got money at some of these, you know, fortresses. But, you know, it's fucking uncomfortable. I've got to tell you, I've got a friend who's a real estate developer. And uh, when these things were happening on the weekend, he sent me a photo of a shovel. And the reason he sent me the photo of a shovel is because we have this ongoing debate. You know, I'm like, Bitcoin might be the thing. And he's like, no, the only thing that's a thing is the gold that I have buried where no one else, you know, in a place where no one, where no one knows where it is. So he sends me the shovel. I send him the Bitcoin logo. And, and, and the, debate, the debate fires on. But certainly an interesting time to be alive, guys. Yeah, that, I, that's a pretty valid point. Uh, and diversification is one of the biggest things, um, regardless of uh, just having 
like assets in a one situation. So an example is like if you have all your money in a bank and a bank goes bust, well, you're roasted. It's the same thing in DeFi. If you have all your funds in one DeFi protocol and it gets hacked, it's gone. If you have all your funds in one wallet, it's gone. Um, if you have all your funds in crypto and crypto goes to zero, it, it, it's roasted. But if you have funds in gold, silver, guns, uh, stocks, real estate, uh, crypto, I mean, even real estate has a, a chance to be roasted. Let's say, for example, you buy a house that's on a sinkhole or the government decides to say, hey, look, we're going to tax you um, 80 percent of your property values every single year. I mean, it's not likely that they do that. But I mean, do you really own your property if you don't pay those taxes? Let me, well, simplify, no, let me you don't. simplify it for you, Drake. Right. So I'm in this position. Right. I have a diversified um asset base. I own real estate in multiple countries. I have stock portfolios. Some of them are government protected in terms of, you know, the structure that you've got in the US is IRAs. In Australia, we've got superannuation. Um, I have money in different currencies around the world. Um, I have, I've got a, like, I do it properly. I've got banks in, I've got accounts in various countries, but here's the problem, right? The real estate, the stocks, um, the fiat currency, when you boil it down, it's all predicated on the current financial system surviving. In the event that the banking system fails and the governments don't have the ability to get out of it, right? at some point, they're going to print so much money that you have hyperinflation and the world ends, as we know it. Okay. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen in my lifetime, but at some point that happens, right? It's just mathematically impossible that it doesn't. So the real estate, the stock, the cash, the money market funds, it's the same bet. If the banks fail, right, then they don't have money to lend out to the incremental buyer of real estate. So real estate prices plummet. Yeah. Very simple, right? If, if there is a credit event, and credit dries up, um, real estate gets hammered. So, you know, you, you try and be diversified and, and, and you can do it across jurisdictions, across asset classes. Um, but when push comes to shove, if these terrible things happen, they're all in the same bucket, right? They're all in the same bucket. Um, equities get annihilated. And, and the only thing that we know of that survives in that world is gold, silver, precious metals, you know, um, commodities, um, depending on how bad it gets, maybe canned food and, and diapers. I don't know, but you, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, you know, I, the largest part of my net wealth is real estate. Because that's the safest thing that you could invest in, you know, forever, right? If you do it properly and you have a long-term view. So that's the largest part of my net worth. But if the banks fail, the price of my real estate's not going up. <laughs> you know, who's going to buy it? If, there's, yeah. if, 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 if in these cataclysmic events, you know, the market comes to a freeze. And if there's no bid, then your offer is zero. If there's no bid, that's it. You can't sell it, right? Um, so, you know, gold, that's great. But, you know, how do we move that around the world? I've got it in various places around the world in physical gold, in vaults. But, you know, the reason we all love Bitcoin is we could possibly use it. All we need is an internet connection. Um, so anyway, I digress. We're getting, you know, we're going down the rabbit hole. It's, it's an interesting time to be alive. It is a, a, a very complicated equation to so, try and solve. Um, it's a moving target. I love these environments um, because there's decisions to make every day. There's adjustments to make every day. There's a new puzzle to try and solve every day. And I'm a gambler at heart. I try and do it in a sophisticated way, but I'm still a gambler at heart. Um, and I love uncertainty because it, 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 it keeps me intellectually interested and curious. Um, and if I can make a buck along the way, that's great. Um, but that, that, that's kind of like a, a, a secondary concern for me right now. Um, so yeah.
Yeah, yeah, it's all about the game. Um, before we close, I want to ask you one other question. Have you heard of the thesis um, that we are going to go to a world where everyone lives on um, like little monthly checks and that inflation or it's not inflation that we need to worry about, but deflation? Um, what I mean by deflation uh, is with technology like the cost of computers, TVs, AI, um, everything, just the cost of stuff going down. Um, what is your thought on the thesis that the real worry is actually a deflationary environment and not an inflationary one? Well, you've got to get over the inflationary environment first, right? Maybe that leads to a deflationary environment and some of these things happen. Um, the, the argument against what you've just described is if you look at the numbers and you have an open mind, um, the concept of, you know, universal basic income, right, which is everyone gets a check every month and, 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 and that kind of keeps right. you going. That notion, um, to a certain extent, that already happens. And Mark Andreessen, um, inventor of Netscape, you know, multi-billionaire, the, 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 the founder and, and, and CEO of Andreessen Horowitz, you know, AZ16, super smart guy, super famous guy, started writing a Substack a couple of weeks ago, and he writes every day. And one day last week, um, he posted a chart which basically showed the price of a basket of goods that was related to tech innovation, right? TVs, music, computers, um, you know, all of these, you know, microwaves, fridges, all of these kind of everyday things that, um, that we produce and we've worked out how to produce very cheaply. And the price of those things is down and to the right. And on the opposite side of this chart, was the cost of another basket of things, education, <clears throat> healthcare, um, you know, electricity, water, um, a lot of other things that we really need, but that the government has highly regulated and that tech innovation has not been allowed to influence as much. It's not a free market. And those are up and to the right. With, with education and healthcare being the outliers in that the steep of the rise of that, of that, of that curve is absolutely ridiculous. So he explains in his article that a deflationary environment <clears throat> is impossible because a lot of what we need to survive, education, healthcare, etc., um, is so highly regulated that the price of it continues to go up at such a fast rate. And the beneficiaries of those things going up is what? The education sector, the healthcare sector, right? Um, a lot of those are government jobs. Oh, and by the way, the, the, the public sector is in there as well, right? The amount of money that is spent on government, right? More employees, grow the IRS, grow this department, grow that department, et cetera, et cetera. So those things are increasing at such an alarming rate um, that that equates to a form of universal basic income where the government is subsidizing those industries by blocking innovation, blocking technical, technological advances and ring fencing those industries so that they cannot become competitive and the price of them cannot come down. So in a world where healthcare the cost of government and education um, is increasing at a rate, you know, double digit increases every single year. You cannot have deflation because that is All an right. indirect way of the government pumping money into the economy. Um, and it goes into the hands of millions and millions of people that work in those industries. So it's not like it's a scam or something like that. It is the government injecting itself into these industries, having a part in blocking innovation and competition, keeping the prices high, 
and filtering money back in through the economy, which keeps, which keeps, uh, which which makes it impossible to own a, an environment where inflation can come down. Does that make sense? I, I would encourage you. Yeah, that makes I'd sense. I'd encourage you just to Google Mark Andreessen Substack, and it was it was a few days ago. It might have been a week ago, and you know it's it's not very long, but there's a chart, and he explains it. And, and it ties in very closely with your question around deflation. Um, it is impossible because the government won't allow it because they'll lose power. They're not going to get it re-elected again um, if they don't find a way to, to, to keep the economy going. And, and some of the ways they do it is, is, is through these regulated industries. And, and by the way, you know, you could put the banking sector in there. You know, the, 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 the compliance cost on banks and on financial services in general skyrocketed post the GFC, probably for good reason, because they were up to some really bad shit. Uh, 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 however, that is a huge industry right now. Compliance in any business that has to deal with, you know, money <clears throat> or banking or financial services or anything like that. So, you know, that is another way of keeping costs high. Yeah, no, that, that's a that's a valid point. I, um, I just heard several different arguments. So just wanted to hear your argument for it. Someone who's uh, really big on it is Jeff Booth. Um, he talks about uh, becoming a def well technology, uh, making a deflationary environment. But um, yeah, no, yeah, but they won't I, allow I, 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 they, I agree. They won't allow it because technology is not allowed to proliferate every industry and, and and this is the yeah. exact point andreessen was making in his article and and the graph illustrates it that wherever the government gets involved you can't get the competition the prices don't come down and the argument the premise of mark's argument was around the context of ai where people are kind of you know hysterically freaking out about ai destroying all these jobs and mark's point is no that doesn't happen because all the government does is they're going to regulate the shit out of it, create all of this compliance, and make it a very snail's crow, um, a very slow kind of you know snail pace uh, 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 trajectory of innovation. Because the regulation is going to stifle it um, out of the fee of all of these different things come, happening. The, the same way that it happens in healthcare, right? You know, to, to getting your drug approved, you need a decade. To get a new medical device approved, you need years, right? It's not a fast-moving um, uh, industry because the government's involvement. So I don't know if he's right, um, but on the data that we currently have, governments continue to to stranglehold these industries and 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 prevent the price of these things to come down, and and there's no reason to think that that ever changes. Sure, TVs will cost yeah, 100 bucks. I agree. But what's it going to cost you to, you know, go get blood tests? <laughs> That's a good point. Good point. So where do you where do you see AI crypto coming to? Is it is it because I know that um Andre Cronge from the the Phantom Foundation, he he basically was saying that you can't have AI, you can't have basically both of them mutually exclusive. Like you can't put AI in a, in a blockchain. And I think something along the lines of that, Drake, do you remember that? Or if you guys I, have seen I, that? I remember, I remember hearing about that. Um, I just didn't really look into it uh, far enough to really even uh, put any validation behind it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Just thinking about these, these AI, um, this narrative and all a lot of other uh, narratives that's already ongoing, but just particularly the, the AI um, narrative. What's your thoughts on that? Look, I, I know Andre, we, 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 we talk briefly from time to time. He's a super sharp guy. Um, if he says you can't do it, you probably can't do it. Um, I have not spent any time looking at it. I just, I just think it's a narrative. I, 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 I'd want to see some things working first before it matters. Um, you know, AI in the real world, uh, you know, unless you're a copywriter or you write essays for a living, hasn't really affected it yet. Um, and the real world works. So crypto and DeFi doesn't work yet. It doesn't work properly yet, right? We're still experimenting. 
Um, so to think that AI can can overlay itself on this industry that still doesn't know, you know, um, its ass from its head, it just seems silly to me. I think it's extremely premature. Um, there is no doubt that there is currently a bubble going on in AI startups um, without anything to do with crypto. Uh, I, 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 I think it'll be a big thing. I just think it's way too early and we don't know what the governments are going to do to try and, you know, to regulate some of these things. I think it's really exciting. Um, the AI conversation just in general across every industry, we don't need to complicate it by talking about crypto where, you know, we can't tie our shoelaces yet, guys. So, you know, get, 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 getting this thing to, yeah. you know, layer that on top of it just seems like um, something really stupid. Uh, so guys smarter than me are going to explain to us why it's a bad idea and Andre could potentially pioneer those discussions. But um, I, 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 I've spent zero time looking at it. I, I, I just think it's a bunch of bullshit at this point. Let's give it six months. Let's give it 12 months. Let's give us something to play with. Give us something to talk about. Um, it, it, it's hot air in my, in, in my opinion so far. Yeah, and that, that was kind of the same thing with DeFi um, in the beginning at first. It was just kind of like a liquidity mining thing until we really found the real utilities in DeFi before. It was just like food farms and um, ape into this, ape into that. Or, I mean, synthetics was a, a pretty cool innovation, but we didn't really get into like the perp dexes or um, smart liquidity management with like an AMM um, until we actually like experimented and played around a bit. Um, yeah, but, Drake, but Nick, yeah, dude. Yeah, but Drake, you know. It still doesn't work properly. Euler got hacked the no, other day for two hundred million. So, you know, there, there, there's we're making progress. There's cool shit happening. There's smart people working on all this stuff, but it is not working. Um, it's not finished. It's incomplete. Um, it's really exciting, but it's incomplete, and it might take years for us to get some of these primitives to actually work. Um, and at that point. Yeah, let's pull some fuel on the fire with AI and all these other cool things. But for now, <laughs> let's just let's just you know make it work. Let's make it safe. It's it, it it is currently still in the experimentation phase, and and I see people getting ahead of themselves, um, and 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 it saddens me. But you know, let's remember, DeFi is what less than three years old. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Right, DeFi summer was the summer of 2020, the US summer of 2020. So it's less than three years old, and um, and let's just not be in a hurry to uh, to grow up. Let, let's try and enjoy it first. Unfortunately, we we can't because there's so much money at risk and so many charlatans trying to steal it, um, and so many incompetent people that blow up. But uh, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way, man. It's been great talking to you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nick, it was an honor to have you on here, man. Uh, enjoyed the chat and give us some plugs, man. Where can we learn more about you? Um, where can we uh, check out the information on Revelo? Where, where is your stomp, stomping ground? Where can more people learn more about you? Yeah, so I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, it's at Nick Dracon. Uh, so you can follow me there. <clears throat> uh, Revelo Intel is revelointel.com. I'm sure the guys have put a link in the description or something like that. Um, like I said, it's a research platform. Um, go to the website, have a look around. Um, it'll explain what it does and how it does it. Um, you know, I make videos on YouTube, on the Revelo Intel YouTube uh, channel. Um, but just start with following me on Twitter and then you can go down the rabbit hole uh, from there. But, um, you know, happy to interact, ask me questions, DM me. Um, I like talking to everybody. And um, thanks for listening. It was a great chat, guys. Dude, it was an honor to have you. And as always, we close all our casts with a wisdom one-liner. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 17. Those are a kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin on themselves. Be good. Be kind, man. Good one, man. Good one. Guys, thanks for coming Perfect. on. Nick, appreciate Thank it, you. man. Thanks, Abs. Thank you, See Nick. See you, Drake.